All right then, let's get started. Uh, my name's Camille. I've been working here for the last couple of years. I have hives on site here at the store, a couple of hives at home as well. And uh, I was mentored by Fred Selby, who is uh, the beekeeper most of you are going to be getting your nukes and packages from. So like I said before, this is a pretty long class. So I've just got a quick um, overview here for you. We have uh, typical benefits of beekeeping. There are way too many to put into one slide, but I'm gonna do my best to kind of narrow some down. We have a brief history of beekeeping, just to kind of fill you in on what's happened over the last couple of thousand years here. Again, trying to keep that kind of short. Um, why bees are in trouble, how you can help. Uh, there's no one simple answer to this, but I'm gonna try to narrow it down a little again. When and how to begin. Kind of an open-ended question, as you might be able to tell, but uh, try to get uh, the focus narrowed down a little bit. Hive composition, placement, and terminology. This is where we're going to be spending most of our time. A lot of people call hive boxes and frames and things a lot of different names. So I'm gonna try and kind of um, get rid of the confusion and really give you a clear picture of what is in your hive, what components you're using, and what are they, what are they for. Um, frames, separate from your hive boxes, your bodies, your, your telescoping tops, just to keep things a little bit organized. Uh, beekeeping tools and apparel. I'm gonna try and cut out anything that's just frilly and just get down to the things that you absolutely need, you need to have in your, in your apiary and you're really sorely missed if you don't have. And we'll go through the social organization of bees, um, uh, what's a drone, what's a queen, what's a worker, what do they do, what's their functionality inside the hive, um, go through different bee breeds and hybrids, and then how you will actually procure your bees, whether it be a package, a nuke, or capturing a swarm. Also have some additional resources at the end, uh, some websites, some books, things like that. So let's get started. So the benefits of beekeeping. There are endless benefits. Everyone knows that uh, Bees pollinate most of our crops. About 70% of your crops are pollinated by honeybees commercially. Um, and it's not only pollination for us, it's also pollination for uh, wildflowers and fruits all over the place. So it's gonna increase biodiversity of any area having a honeybee hive around. And as we all know, honey's delicious in all sorts of treats. You can use it as a sugar, sugar substitute. It's wonderful and honey butter makes it easy to spread. Um, it can be used in drinks as well, like mead or June, which is kind of like kombucha, but uses honey instead of uh, granulated sugar. Honey can also help with allergies as long as it's a local honey, because your unfiltered honey is going to have small granules of pollen in there, which is going to kind of adapt your system to the allergens. Um, honey and wax and propolis can all be used as um, uh, medical purposes as well. They can be used as topicals, they can be used as chews, all sorts of things. Um, the wax can be used for just about anything, just a couple little things here. You can use them as candles, most people think of that. Uh, lip balm, seals, furniture, uh, polish, things like that. Propolis is an interesting kind of thing. Um, bees make it out of basically anything sticky they can find, usually tree saps and things like that. And it's what's called bee glue. The reason you need a hive tool when you're working in the apiary is because all of your boxes and things are stuck together. They're glued with propolis. So it's really important to have your hive tool around and to know why everything's stuck shut. Uh, propolis isn't only used as a sealant. It's also used as uh, a device against bacteria and things. So a uh, heavy propolizing hive could be more hygienic because propolis is antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal. Um, your carniolans are pretty high propolizing bees. So they will be a little bit less apt to get things like chalk brood. And benefits of beekeeping, you'll never be bored again. <laughs> so going into a brief history, Trying to keep this down to two slides. Um, humans began as robbers of honeybees. So they would do a lot of destruction beekeeping. And then after a while, they realized the importance of these hives and they would try to only take as much as they really needed. 
Um, they would use the honey, the brood as, as food and uh, medical supply, um, even use it as currency. If you had a stake of two or three hives, somebody stole from you, that was considered a crime. So the photos on the side here are some really early um, interactions with bees. They're cave paintings found from 8 to 6,000 BC. The top rock painting is in Spain. The bottom is found in Zimbabwe. The cool thing about the bottom photo here is you'll actually see this is one of our first indicators that humans were using smoke to pacify the bees as they're harvesting the honey. Um, the earliest actual domestication of bees rather than just harvest of wild bees dates somewhere around seven, um, 970 to 930 BC in Tel Rehav, Israel. Uh, they, they found an ancient apiary, which didn't look like much in pictures, so I didn't actually throw it in here, but 75 to 200 um, cylinder hives. As you can tell, 75 to 200 is a pretty wide span, so they're, it, it's kind of hard to uncover stuff like that. But sun-dried mud, just as simple as that. Um, this brings me to my next point. Uh, when bee husbandry began, the hives were built using the cheapest, most abundant materials available. So the sun-dried mud, obviously pretty inexpensive. You find mud all over the place. You can shape it. It's not uh, very much cost to the person at all. So sun-dried mud, fired clay, reed baskets. Um, today we use a lot of wood, but you can even use reed baskets insulated with dung. Honeybees will live in just about anything as long as you get the dimensions right. Um, throughout the centuries, bees have been used as uh, direct resource collection, pollination, and interestingly enough, uh, even warfare. The rhododendron honey along the Black Sea, you may have heard about mad honey. It has such a high concentration of rhododendron nectar that it can actually be poisonous or a hallucinogen. So um, unsuspecting armies would go through the area, find bee colonies, collect the honey, thinking everything's fine. They've collected honey before. And by the next day, they would be so incapacitated they couldn't fight. The locals caught on to this, stashed it, and started feeding it to invading armies. <laughs> so multiple armies from multiple different countries around that area have actually been completely subdued by the rhododendron honey. That being said, the rhododendrons aren't thick enough in this area to really cause a problem. So if you've got a few rhododendrons in your yard, please don't worry, it's, it's not gonna do anything. Uh, booby traps, this is kind of an interesting one. When you think of the medieval castle age, uh, the big drawbridges, when those bridges fall, there's not much to really uh, stop invading forces. So they would trap the skep hives or the basket reed, reed basket hives so that when the gates fell, it would pull the hives over, all of the bees would come out, and then the invaders would be attacked by angry honeybees. I know I wouldn't want to walk into that. <laughs> um, moving way, way forward here, uh, movable frames had been experimented with in many years previous. Langstroth is absolutely not the first person to do this, but L.L. Langstroth has uh, patented the movable frame with regards to bee space, which is a 3 8 inch uh, measurement in 1852, and that begins our modern history of beekeeping. So um, the hives that you see today, all of your tall boxes, these are all Langstroth hives, and they're the most common hive used today. So let's move on to where honeybees are found today. We're gonna go to a different, couple different locations. Uh, we're gonna look at nature, we're gonna look at the backyard, which is what we're focusing on today. And we're going to focus on um, a little bit of commercial as well. It definitely helps to understand um, where bees are located everywhere. And it'll help you with where bees are going to be located in your own home. So in nature, you'll usually find them in living trees, hollowed out living trees, uh, typically hardwoods. If you see them on a branch exposed, like in this middle photo here, it's pretty rare and it's a really interesting sight to see, but these bees are probably not going to survive the winter. They can't, they can't be wet and cold and exposed to the wind like this. So really these bees only hope is either to um, abscond from this nest and find a new location or for a, a beekeeper to come along and put them inside a hive. In 
in the backyard. This is where we're mostly going to be focusing today. Um, not too many hives in an area, usually backyard beekeepers or anywhere between one hive and probably 15. Um, they're close to the ground. They're usually in pretty close proximity. Um, obstacles can be a problem, close fences and things for flight paths. But we'll get into that a little bit later. And they're also found in commercial operations. And in recent years, a lot of the commercial operations have gotten a bad rap for um, disease spread, mite spread, things like that. But we also have to consider that without the commercial guys, we're not gonna have any commercial food and we're not going to have any backyard nukes or packages. All the nukes and packages are coming from the commercial guys and without them, we'd be in a really sore spot. They are intensely managed. Usually you'll see uh, four hives per pallet. There's zero spacing at all. And they, they do treat, so they're, they're trying to um, control the mite populations, but in such a dense setting, things spread pretty quickly. Uh, which brings me to my next point, why bees are in trouble. The nature of their foraging habits makes them very susceptible to pesticides. They're covered in hairs, they'll pick everything up. Um, they're on all these parts of the, of the plant, particularly uh, pesticides that are uh, internal and spread throughout the, the system of the plant. When those nectaries are harvested from, uh, pesticides can stay inside the plant, get transferred to the nectar, and in turn kill the bee and everything the bee takes its, its nectar home to. Um, as I said before, commercial pollination can spread pests and diseases. When you have this many bees from all across the country going to the almond fields for two weeks altogether, you're, you're going to have quite a bit of spreading going on. Um, urbanization, changes in agriculture can lead to loss of habitat. So um, monocropping can be a problem. If you have a crop that's all going to bloom and be done for the year in two weeks, you're going to have to move those bees, and that's going to cause some problems. So briefly going over colony collapse disorder. It's not necessarily a one uh, symptom thing. Colony collapse disorder is extremely variable. It has all sorts of different causes. Um, I'm kind of second guessing myself putting this in a circle because you can go any which direction with any of these things. Usually colony collapse disorder starts with a bad year. So you have bad weather, you have poor forage, poor forage leads to low nutrition, which lowers um, the bees defenses against all sorts of other things. There's disease, there's mites. Um, if you have a bad year, particularly with uh, crop pests, pesticides can be used, uh, pesticide damage is going to happen. All these things can come together and eventually lead to a colony collapse disorder. So responsible beekeeping, um, this is a pretty variable term. You can do all sorts of things here. Um, you're not going to learn it all in one day. You're probably not gonna learn it all in 50 years. So the best thing you can do is talk to other beekeepers, get involved with your local beekeeping associations, uh, check out the Oregon Master Beekeeper Program, all sorts of things that you can do. Um, it's a skill with a rich historical tradition Looking back at our history pages, it's been going on for a long time. It's been changing. Um, there's research going on for honeybee nutrition, all sorts of fun things. So when and how to begin? You have to consider the costs and you have to start early. Um, it's January now, this is a great time to get started, start collecting your gear, building, painting, things like that. Um, read for sure find out which management practices, which hive setup looks best for you. The cost is definitely something to consider. Um, it has been getting more expensive over the years, pretty consistently. Upfront costs are usually where it's gonna hurt the most and it's going to get slightly lower over the, over the course of the years. Um, what I did to start out is I started really small. I'd buy a hive box, I'd buy a couple of frames, and I just continue until I had the entire setup. Um, but considering you do have a little bit of a time limit here, um, package and new bees arrive anywhere between April and May. So make sure you have everything set up by then. It 
and when and how to begin. We're going to do some general seasonal tasks in the apiary. Um, this depends highly on weather. Every year is a little bit different, but this is just some loose guidelines, uh, things you might want to look out for. We're still in the middle of winter, which goes somewhere from November to April. So this is when you are building and repairing your bee equipment. You are analyzing how many hives you have in your apiary versus how many you want in the spring, just kind of figuring out the logistics of what the next year will bring. And it is January, so we're beginning pre-orders for um, package bees and nuke bees right now. And we're going to be going through pre-ordering probably into April. In April and May, you're going to be installing your package bees, your nuke bees. You're going to be getting them built up for the honey flow. So you're gonna be feeding, 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 and treating for varroa disruptor, which is probably the most dangerous test you're gonna to have to face and ever present. They're, it's a very rare hive that isn't affected by varroa mites and a very sparse hive. You've got to have them miles away from any other hive to have any chance that you're not really going to have varroa at all. Um, adding your boxes as your colonies grow. This is something we'll get into a little bit later when we talk about actually building the hive, but your hive configuration is going to change throughout the year as the bees grow in population and in resources. In May and June, um, you're going to add your honey super or supers, depending on the year. You may use one honey super, you may end up harvesting and putting that super back on, or you may end up leaving that full honey super on and adding an additional super. Um, you're gonna be continuing hive inspections May and June, it's really important to keep up on it. Uh, I've got a question in chat, what is a super? So a super is one of these terms that it has a lot of different names for the same thing. A super is a honey box. Typically you have um, brood boxes, which are the large boxes at the bottom. And then once you are ready for honey collection for yourself, you're going to put a slightly smaller box on top and that's your honey super or honey box or um, any number of terms. Um, going back to May and June, um, when you have your honey super on or your honey box, you're not going to be treating for varroa. Varroa mites you're going to be treating as often as possible throughout the year, but when you have your box on that's going to have your honey harvest that you're going to consume, you don't want to be medicating that because you don't want um, formic acid and you don't want thymol in the honey that you're eating. Uh, July and August, this is around the time you're going to be harvesting your honey. Um, that's a whole nother can of worms, so we're going to get into that in a completely different class. But you're also going to continue your hive inspections, uh, make sure there's no disease, make sure your mites are in control. You're also going to be watching for late season robbing. And robbing is an interesting activity. It can be done by any number of pests. Um, skunks can rob a hive, mice can rob a, rob a hive to an extent. Other honeybees are uh, going to be robbing as well. It's kind of an advanced foraging technique. They want to get the easy, the easy honey. There's not a lot of things blooming. They're going to try and steal from all the other hives. So keep an eye on that. Um, look at the entrance of your hive. See what kind of activity is going on. Are they fighting at the entrance? Is everything going smoothly? Um, Yellow jackets are another really common contributor of robbing, and that's that's going to be a big one to look out for. And there are definitely ways of helping with robbing, but there's not really any stopping it. So we'll get into entrance reducers and uh, stopping robbing a little bit later when we're building the hive. In July and August, we're also going to begin fall feeding which is different from spring feeding. And I'll get into that a little bit later. I have a, a slide on feeding as well. Uh, September, October, we're watching for late season robbing again. Uh, towards the end of October, when the rains start, robbing pressure is going to really lay off. You're not really gonna have to worry about it. You're going to stop feeding liquid syrup because again, as the rains start, it's gonna be way too moist. You don't want too much moisture in your hive. The bees aren't going to be able to consume liquid sugar syrup in the winter time. 
uh, winterizing equipment. We're going to get into that in a different class. I have an entire class on winterizing. So that's probably going to be happening, I'd say, October-ish. And that's going to be a free class as well. So what hive setup should I use? This is entirely up to you. I can't tell you which hive setup is best for you. The bees, as I said before, are flexible. They'll be in wicker baskets insulated with them. They'll be in plastic hives. They'll be in wooden hives. They'll hang out in a, a hollowed out tree. As long as you're happy with your hive equipment, you're happy and you're comfortable inspecting those bees and working those bees, that's what's really important. So it's a big investment and you have to weigh your options pretty carefully, but there's a hive out there for basically everyone. We are going to be focusing on the Lingstroth hive, either eight frame or 10 frame, just a different size. Um, literally the eight frame holds eight frames and the 10 frame holds 10 frames. But there's a hive out there for everyone. There's the Flow Hive, which is an adaptation of the Langstroth Hive, just with a different honey super and a different method of uh, extraction. There is the Top Bar Horizontal or Slovenian Cabinet Hive. And these are really awesome for people who don't have the, the energy to lift all of that. Um, a 10 frame Langstroth Deep Box can weigh upwards of 100, 120 pounds if it's completely honey bound. And a lot of people just can't lift that much weight. I have a hard time myself. So the top bar, horizontal and Slovenian cabinet hives, being as though they're horizontal, or they're horizontal instead of vertical, you're lifting one frame instead of an entire box full of frames. They have their own management issues. Um, the top bar hive can be difficult to feed and it can be difficult to medicate, but you're lifting 10 pounds instead of 100. So it's definitely an option to weigh. They're also quite a bit lower to the ground. So if you have small children or if you have to sit while you're doing uh, your hive inspections, this, this could definitely be an option for you. Uh, honey harvest is a big thing when you're choosing your hive as well. Not all hives can be harvested in the same manner. The Langstroth hive I think is the easiest to harvest. You can harvest however you see fit. You can take a frame and put it in a centrifuge, spin the centrifuge and harvest all the honey uh, in bulk. You can take a foundationless frame and you can cut it into cut comb honey when you have the wax and the honey in, uh, in the jar. You can do what's really interesting, a Ross round. If you've ever seen this, it's, it's a frame and it has several round um, kind of combs in there. All you have to do is you take the combs out, put a lid on there, and you're done. It's kind of an expensive system, but it's definitely worth looking into. Kind of interesting. I think the only thing I didn't talk about here is the German plastic hive. And uh, when we were talking about beekeeping history, it's simply a, a different material. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily cheaper, but usually the German plastic hive is a Langstroth hive that's made of plastic instead of wood. Uh, I think the way that they promote this is it has better insulation for heat and for cold weather. So that's something to look into, but I've never actually handled the German plastic hive myself, so I don't have much input there. The photo down here at the bottom is kind of interesting from the hive and the honeybee. This is a Slovenian cabin bee house. So each of these little squares in here Every one of those is a beehive. You walk into the building and you pull out a drawer and then you see all the frames and you can lift the frames. Not something that's practical for backyard beekeepers, but I like to put it in here because it's just so interesting. Going into hive placement. Once you've chosen your hive, you know what you're going to be dealing with. Um, location is very important. You want to have your hives completely ready built, painted, and in place at least a month before the bees get there. If any problems arise, you're going to know what's going on. And the paint needs time to dry and to vent because the honeybees won't tolerate that icky paint smell. And it will usually cause an abscond if you've got wet paint on your hive. Um, you wanna consider how many hives you're going to have. Two is pretty ideal for a backyard scenario. It's actually a lot better than having one. Um, 
when you have two hives versus one, it's not really much extra work. And if you have a problem with one hive, you can usually supplement it with the other hive. So you have one really weak hive and one really strong hive. Take a couple of frames out of the stronger hive, put it into the weaker hive, and uh, you can supplement them that way. Um, hive boxes can be marked so bees can recognize home. This prevents a phenomenon which is called drift. Um, when we're talking about commercial beekeeping, the bees will drift into the wrong colony. And if a sick bee goes from a sick colony into a healthy colony, it can infect the healthy colony. Um, but bees are really good at recognizing patterns and shapes. So if you have an X on the entrance of one hive, a squiggly on the entrance of another, they're gonna recognize which one is home based on the shape. Uh, the only color really to avoid when you're marking your hives or doing a mural or whatever you see fit, um, bees can't really see red. So it's kind of a grayish color for them. So anything but red is totally fine as far as uh, marking your hives. When you're painting your hives though, you also want to avoid dark colors. Pastels are great, but you don't want the bees to overheat in a really dark hive. Direction of the entrance is also pretty important. You want to protect the entrance from wind. You want the bees to easily be able to take off and land at the entrance. Uh, morning sun is going to wake the bees up. They're not really gonna want to leave home until they see the sun. So southeastern exposure with a potential wind block is, is always a good idea. Um, I like to use deciduous trees. I have my hives in my backyard where I can clean up any debris or fallen branches or leaves so I can keep an eye on it. Um, it has really good shade in the summertime with some good morning sun. And then in the wintertime, when there's not much sun, it gets full sun because all of the leaves have fallen and I've got, I've got uh, no shade there. Um, keep the entrance six feet from high traffic areas and obstacles. Bees tend to want to have a nice clear area to come in and to go out. Um, it's kind of the bee line. They, they wanna go in, out six feet and then they change direction typically. That's not to say that you couldn't have something a little bit closer to the fence. Mine is probably five feet from my fence and they still deal all right with it. Um, but six feet is kind of uh, your point of reference. You don't wanna be walking within six feet of the entrance. You don't want any high traffic areas. You're not gonna have any trouble if you've got at least a six foot barrier there. Uh, being a good neighbor is always a good thing when it comes to beekeeping. Neighbors can be a little frightened of bees. They might not know very much about them. So it's good to keep the window of all the communication open. If they have any questions, let them know that they can come to you. It's also good to keep, uh, keep up on the laws. There aren't very many laws on beekeeping in this area. So it's pretty lenient. Um, as far as I know, nuisance laws, the same kind of law that you can call your neighbor out for having his uh, radio blasting at three in the morning is the same thing that applies to beekeeping locally. There is, however, um, some state laws in place that you should be aware of if you're having a couple of hives. Um, this is only for apiaries of five or more hives. So if you have four hives, you have no, no laws other than nuisance laws. Um, as of June, 2021, if you own five or more colonies, then your apiary should be registered with the Oregon Department of Agriculture or the ODA. Yearly registration for an apiary of five or more colonies is $10 plus 50 cents per hive. Um, the registration has to be filed before June 1st of each year. That gives you time to make sure that you have your counts right, make sure that your colonies are strong, make sure that you know how many hives you're going to have for the rest of the year. Um, only full-sized healthy colonies are counted. So if you have a five-frame nuke, this doesn't count. You can have four full-size colonies and a five-frame nuke, and you're, you're still within your limits there. All of the proceeds uh, from the registration are going to go to OSU Honeybee Labs, and they're doing research on um, honeybee health, honeybee nutrition, varroa mites, things like that. Um, you can register at the link here. Um, you can also find more information um, on organ beekeeping laws 
from OSU's extension. Um, I've given you guys all this pamphlet right here. You can find all the same information here and you can find lots of uh, email addresses and references as well. All right, so we're getting into links are up high of terminology and composition. I'll be going through which component is called what, um, what slang terms you may hear. So hopefully I'll alleviate confusion between honey supers, hive boxes, and this, that, and the other. Um, the industry standard for commercial beekeeping is the 10 frame length strong hive. So that's what we're going to be dealing with today. If you are considering an eight frame hive instead of a 10 frame, just consider you're having two fewer frames. So in short, for one full Langstroth hive setup, uh, 10 frame, you're going to need uh, top to bottom, the telescoping top or the lid, which goes over the top of your box and make sure that no rain gets in. It's uh, completely watertight. You're going to have a feeder and there are lots of different options for feeders. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, a Vivaldi or an inner uh, standard inner cover. The inner cover is really important because your, your boxes are going to be pretty sticky. And because your telescoping top isn't flush with the top box, it goes over the top box, the inner cover is going to prevent the telescoping top from sticking. Um, it's gonna get a, it's gonna be a huge mess if you forget this piece. So the inner cover is incredibly important. Um, I've got a honey super here, and inside each of these boxes. Um, will be frames. So inside this honey super, we're working with a 10 frame box. We have 10 frames. Um, the queen excluder is not pictured here um, and it's not always used, but if you're going to use a queen excluder, that's going to be right below your honey super to prevent your queen from rising into your honey super and contaminating your honey with a bunch of eggs and larvae. Um, we're going to have two deep boxes. This is basically your uh, your house for your bees. You don't touch this stuff, this is all for them. And we have two boxes here. They're two 10 frame boxes. So we have 20 frames, 10 in each box. An entrance reducer, which you can kind of see in the photo here. And this helps out for many different reasons. Your entrance reducer is going to help your bees um, find home. It's going to help them um, with temperature regulation. It's also going to help a lot when it comes to robbing because uh, your typical bee entrance is pretty long here. And if you have a bunch of yellow jackets coming in, it's gonna be really hard to defend. If you have an entrance reducer that two guard bees can easily defend, the robbing pressure is going to be reduced in a big way. We have um, the screen bottom board. This is just the base here. This gives your bees uh, a landing area. It introduces the entrance. It also has the screen which is helpful for temperature regulation. You can insert a mite board into this board as well. And uh, not pictured again here is the hive stand. The screen bottom board shouldn't be on the ground. Not only is it going to rot out the wood, but it's also going to bite all sorts of interesting little pests that are on the ground already, like uh, ants and beetles and things. And I gotta say I'm a bit of a penny pincher. I like cinder blocks as my hive stand. I just use two cinder blocks, works perfectly for a 10 frame or an eight frame hive. But you can get really crazy and carried away with it. You can do anything from cinder blocks to uh, pallets to really fancy stands where you can adjust um, exactly how your hive is sitting if you want it tilted one way or the other. Usually you're gonna want your hive to be completely flat and even. Um, the bubble level should be straight in the center. But in the wintertime, it can be beneficial to actually tilt your hive so the entrance is facing slightly downward and any moisture that comes down will run out. So this picture here has several completed hives. This is before the honey super is on. This is just your brood nest. But as you can see, they look a little bit different. Um, the typical hive setup over here on the right has two deep brood boxes. And this is your entire bee house. This is all your bees will really need for, for them. The same kind of configuration can be made with three Western brood boxes. And this is the configuration that I use at home. The reason I do this, a um, couple of reasons really, is the Western brood box or your typical honey super 
is quite a bit smaller than your deep box and it's a lot lighter. So it's easier for the beekeeper to work with. They don't have to, to lift quite as much. Um, it's also really handy if you're swapping your boxes back and forth. Is so different than a medium? Mediums and supers, I'm using kind of interchangeably here. Um, it's different than mm -hmm. the, the, the Western is the same as your honey super. I don't use shallow boxes because they're just too small and it's kind of confusing having three different box sizes. So we are using brood boxes and Western boxes, just the two sizes, keeping things simple. <laughs> So 10 frame versus eight frame. To someone who hasn't heard this terminology before, it can be kind of confusing. I know when I was first getting started learning all these numbers in here and all these different box sizes were really confusing, but it's pretty simple. The eight frame and the 10 frame box are just a little bit different, different as far as width. The length is the same, just the width is different. So your 10 frame box down on the bottom is going to hold two extra frames. It's just 16 and a quarter inch instead of 14 inches. It's the only real difference. The weight is really going to be the thing you're considering when you're looking at eight frame versus 10 frame. Um, a single brood box for 10 frame can weigh upwards of at least hundred pounds, which is pretty significant. Your eight frame equipment, uh, a deep box is probably gonna be somewhere closer to 80 pounds. And that makes a big difference out in the field, especially when you're when you're doing four or five or even 12 hives. So two box styles with many names. This is kind of what we were going over with on, uh, on the slide before. We're dealing with honey supers up top and we're dealing with brood boxes down at the bottom. Honey supers are called honey supers, honey boxes, Western boxes, Western hive bodies, medium hive bodies. There's all these different terms, but they're all the same box. So it can get a little bit confusing, trying to make it a little bit simpler. Um, if you're really confused and you have multiple different boxes you're looking at, they have shallows thrown in there, for instance, you're looking at the shelf and you're confused. The height on this box is six and five eighths inches. So whip out a measuring tape and everything's fine. It doesn't matter what it's called. Um, the brood chambers, nine and five eighths. So your brood boxes can be called deep hive bodies, uh, deep boxes, brood chambers, brood nests, brood boxes, the list goes on. But the idea is there's big boxes and there's smaller boxes. So I'm mean, just drill a hole in the front to let the bees in and out. Make sure they have them they have the entrance at the bottom. This is an additional entrance. Um, this hive setup right here has quite a few boxes on there. We have two honey supers and two brood boxes. So by adding an entrance in your honey super as well, you're encouraging the bees to go straight into that honey super and fill it up faster. Whereas otherwise they'd have to go down to the bottom brood box, rise all the way up in order to store that honey. But it's definitely something to be concerned about during robbing season because that's an extra entrance, that's an extra entrance that needs to be defended. So keep an eye on it and you may have to cover it up. Um, usually I think it's a, I think it's a three quarter inch hole that I drill. I need to double check on that, but uh, a wine cork fits perfectly. Makes it fun, you have to buy the bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's build a hive. Um, this part hopefully is gonna be really simple. I am basically just going to start at the bottom and we're going to build a hive from the bottom up. It's going to wind up looking like this picture here in the center. And I'm gonna talk about uh, different hive components and what they're doing as well. So the screen bottom board, this is the base of the hive. It goes on top of your hive stand. Um, it provides the actual entrance to your bees. Um, I don't know if you can tell in here, but this, board right here is a little bit lower than uh, the pieces at the back. So this provides probably about uh, a 5 8 inch entrance for the bees. And this is how they're going to get in and out of your hive. The screen at the bottom here is going to allow airflow. It's going to help regulate temperature. The bees are going to be able to, to figure out temperature a little bit better. When needed, the screen can be blocked by inserting a mite board. 
So this is going to help you with mite checks. This is also going to help you if it's really, really cold out and you need a little bit of extra insulation. Just insert the board that basically eliminates the screen portion of it. So it's, it's movable. And then the boxes are going to be placed above your screen bottom board. Um, this bottom left photo here, this is how you're going to receive your boxes. They're not going to be fully built because they don't fit very well on a store shelf that way. So you're just going to have a bunch of boards that are going to be built into your brood boxes here. And the brood boxes or the brood chambers are going to literally house the colony. Um, food is going to be stored here. Brood is going to be raised here or baby bees. Um, the workers, the drones, and the queen all reside within these boxes. The placement, I'm gonna try and make this kind of simple. Your first box goes on your screen bottom board. Um, when you're ready to add a second box, it goes directly on top of the first box. And it can be, it's not really a time sensitive thing as much as a colony sensitive thing when you add this next box. You start with one box and you keep an eye on your bees. You do your once every two weeks hive inspection. And when your bees begin to fill out that box, once it's about 70% full of um, worked frames, so your, your bees are using these frames for brood, for food, um, for everything, that's when you add your next box. So in a 10 frame hive, you have three empty frames still in that, that bottom box, that's when you add the new one. All right, working to the queen excluder, considering that all brood boxes are on, we're getting to the point where the blackberries are in bloom and you're ready to start collecting honey. The queen excluder goes on top of your brood boxes and below your honey super. And what this does is the screen is large enough that it allows the workers to go through both ways, but it is small enough that the larger queen cannot pass through the screen. So you're preventing the queen from moving up into your honey boxes and laying eggs and larvae in what you're trying to harvest for your table. And not everybody uses a queen excluder, particularly if you have brand new undrawn frames in your honey super. Um, usually what I'll do is I'll leave the excluder off until they begin drawing the wax in the honey super. Once the wax is starting to be drawn, it's not completely full, but there's a lot of interest. The bees are up there in the honey super. That's when I'll put the excluder on just to make sure the queen is not through. Let's see, question in chat. What does drawing wax mean? So honeybees excrete wax from their bodies. They, they have kind of wax scales that they come, that come off. They take those wax scales, put a little bit of saliva in there, and then they work it into the wax that you see on your frames. When you first get frames, they're not going to be drawn. They're going to be essentially just flat pieces of plastic or thin wax. They're, they're not going to have any depth to them. When the bees draw their wax, they're drawing out their cells so that uh, a bee can be raised in there or food can be stored. Actually, I actually have an example right here. So hopefully you guys can see me. Uh, this is an undrawn frame right here. It's just some plastic foundation. This is going to help the bees begin to draw. And this frame has drawn wax. And hopefully you can tell these are actually pretty deep cells that can be actually used. Let's see, where were we? Talking about the honey super. So this stores um, mostly honey and some pollen as well. Um, the idea is to get your honey supers as full as possible and capped before you harvest. If you harvest uncapped honey, the chances are it's got too much liquid in it and it can actually turn bad and ferment. So if they're capped, the bees have finished their, their progress, they've gotten the honey down to the point where it is somewhere between um, 20 and 18% moisture and it's not going to go bad. Capped honey is honey forever. Uncapped honey, if you shake it and it's still liquid and it falls out, 
that's not ready for harvest and it's not shelf stable. Let's see, I've got a question in chat. How heavy are these usually and how often do we need to do the physical aspect of lifting and moving these? So that depends on your hive setup. If you're using a Langstroth hive, your typical honey super box is gonna be somewhere around 60 to 80 pounds. You'll need to lift these anytime you're doing a hive inspection. So typically once every two weeks. If you're using a different hive setup, like um, say you're using a top bar hive, your top bar hive is going to grow instead of upwards side. So you'll be able to easily lift these one at a time and you'll be lifting 10 pounds instead of 100. So it can be a lot easier that way. Um, let's see, when do I add the supers? So when bees have reasonably filled their brood boxes, they are populous enough to begin storing honey. Um, usually this is sometime in late spring, early summer. June is usually when I put my honey supers on. We're looking for lots of flowers blooming, lots of bees bringing nectar in. When you're doing your hive inspections, you should see lots of uh, nectar in your frames. And you'll be able to easily tell when there's nectar in your frames. One, because your frames are gonna be a whole lot heavier. And two, because these uncapped um, nectar is gonna be kind of shiny. You'll be able to see all the liquid in your frames. Um, looking out just in nature to see what's blooming. Blackberries are your major, major nectar flow. This is usually when you're collecting honey for you. There are other nectar flows throughout the year, but you're usually using those for your honeybees for, for them to build up. So the maple honey flow, for instance, this is your big spring buildup. Right when you get your packages, your nukes, the maples are going to be flowering, you're going to be bringing in lots of resources, but that's, that's really for them. Um, like I said, you'll see lots of nectar during hive inspection. How many supers? Uh, this is one of those scenarios where if you ask 10 different beekeepers the same question, you're gonna wind up with at least 12 different answers. Mm -hmm. So it varies from year to year. If you have an amazing year, you're probably going to need a couple honey supers. But as I said before, lots of different answers to the same question. It depends on how you wanna harvest. If you are harvesting one frame at a time, if you're harvesting one box at a time, or if you wanna do a mass harvest and you're harvesting all of your honey supers at the same time, you're going to be having different numbers of boxes on at different times. Um, I usually harvest all at once and I use a centrifuge. So I will continue adding boxes as I need until honey harvest time, which is sometime around uh, the end of July. And then I'll harvest whatever I have, put the boxes back on and let the bees clean those boxes out. Now I'm moving up. Above the honey super, you're going to have your Vivaldi inner cover. Um, this is kind of a gray area because the Vivaldi inner cover doesn't necessarily go on top of your honey super. It can go on top of your brood boxes. It's kind of a telescoping thing. Your inner cover is always going to be below your lid. That's the main rule. The whole point of the inner cover is to prevent your lid from sticking to the rest of the hive, which can cause a lot of, uh, a lot of mess. I've left the Vivaldi inner cover off before just to see how much of a trouble it was. It took me about 10 minutes to get the lid off. Mm -hmm. So trust me, just, just have an inner cover of some kind. You can get as fancy with it as you want, just as long as you've got an inner cover that separates that top from the, the rest of the hive bodies. The Vivaldi is my preferred inner cover. Um, the standard is just a flat board with a hole in it. It works, but the Vivaldi has some extra functionality, which I really like. Um, it provides extra ventilation. There's screened holes in here. So bees don't actually enter your Vivaldi inner cover through these holes. It's just for ventilation. Um, it also provides an area for a feeder, which is my favorite way of feeding. I like the top feeder. You don't have to actually crack the entire hive. So if it's a little bit windy, a little bit cold, you don't want to do a hive inspection, you don't have time to pull the whole hive apart. All you have to do is take the lid off, dump in the food, you're done. So the, the top feeder is definitely my feeder of choice here. Um, I mentioned earlier, you might not have remembered, that was quite a while ago, but uh, <laughs> uh, in wintertime, you don't feed liquid feed because there's too much moisture in the air and the bees can't handle liquid feed. 
So you remove your, your top feeder during the winter time, which gives you lots of room in your Vivaldi inner cover for moisture wicking materials or insulating materials. If we have a really cold winter, you can just take a piece of house insulation, throw it in a sealed bag, do not put it in there raw, make sure it's sealed. Um, and you can use that as an insulator, keep your hive a little bit warmer. Um, if you just put the raw insulation in there, they'll rip it apart and you'll never see it again. So as long as it's in a bag, they'll leave it alone. But uh, you can put pine shavings in here, you can put burlap in here, you can put a beach towel in here, anything that will wick the moisture out of your hive and you can replace that with dry material throughout the winter. Um, where did he get his name? This is actually kind of interesting. Uh, the owner of Highland Garden is constantly coming up with all of these awesome inventions. He uh, designed this and he actually named it for uh, uh, Antonio Vivaldi's Four Seasons because you use it all year long. You can use it for winter, you can use it for spring, you can use it for ventilation in summer. Uh, basically, this, this is a pretty awesome thing. I, I'll never go back to the standard undercover. Nearing the top here, we're actually at the telescoping top. The telescoping top is just the lid for your colony. And it's called a telescoping top because your hive grows and it shrinks and you have different components on at different times. So it telescopes and it always remains on the hive. There are different types of tops and the telescoping top is definitely my favorite. It is heavy, it encompasses the entire hive instead of just part of it. So it keeps the rain off. It's heavy enough to withstand the winds that we have here in Fort Atlas. Um, and it also has a top which will reflect the light and help with temperature regulation. This is always going to go on top of your quality cover or your standard inner cover. You don't want this getting stuck on your colony. Let's see. Getting into frame sizes. I think I'm going to take a quick intermission. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be right back. Thank you. Yes. You want to take a back in the second file? And we need to be in place. Maybe we should go one of those slow down. Uh, right. We need to slow down. It was, um, do you really want to walk into a shed with all your units flying around inside? Sounds scary. Why do you think all the friends are going to be inside? Yes. Sounds scary. I was trying to think. And I would put. I was thinking of putting them at the end of the. Um, raised beds could be a good spot because it would get them plenty of room, but maybe facing the room. Like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want them to be facing towards the, the sun. To the south, south. Slash is yeah. Which is what they're doing now. Yes. When you're inside, there's no you're doing it. 
Thanks for your patience. Talk way too much and my throat gets way too dry. <laughs> All right. So we talked about building the actual hive. Now we're talking about what goes inside. Um, we're considering frames here, and this is a whole nother can of worms. There's lots of different frame sizes, lots of different frame uh, configurations. Um, when we're considering frame, it's literally just the outside of what the bees build on. Uh, foundation is slightly different, and we're going to get into that a little bit later as well. So interesting question here. It does come up every now and then. Can I use Western frames in a deep hive box? You can do it. But when you're using a Western frame in a deep hive box, the bees want to draw out all of the available space. So you're gonna get what's called burr comb. There's a little bit of burr comb at the bottom of this frame right here. This is just comb that's away from the frame itself. And this is going to be really delicate. And usually you're gonna to wanna to scrape this away. So in a pinch, you can use these frames but they're going to be a big hassle and it's better to just get the right size frame, the right size box. Um, how many frames do I need? It's always good to have a few extra frames on hand. Um, sometimes you'll get bulk deals. If you get 10 frames, you get 10% off here. Um, so always a good idea to have a couple extra on hand. Frames do break. Uh, eventually you're going to have frames that are old. You can tell that this is actually an old brood frame. Um, the, the wax is really dark here, and it doesn't last forever. I'm about to actually retire this frame, but I thought it would be kind of cool to bring it into class. So I would replace this one this year. Um, so for your 10 frame hive configuration, which we've been talking about, 10 frames, obviously, for one box. In your hive configuration, you're going to have two deep brood boxes for your colony. So that's going to be 20 deep frames. And then you're going to have one Western box for your honey super, and you're going to need 10 frames for that. The eight frame hive configuration is pretty much similar, um, except you're dealing with eight frames per box instead of 10 frames per box. So two deep brood boxes will yield um, 16 deep frames. One Western box is eight frames. So B space. This is what Reverend L. L. Langstroth is famous for. He determined the space at which bees will not propolize or build comb. So if there's too little space, they're gonna to wanna to fill in that space, they're gonna propolize it and everything's gonna be stuck together. If there's too much space, they're going to want to add comb to that space and put resources there. And that's gonna be a mess too. If you try and take your frames apart, they're all glued together with propolis or they're all filled in with wax and you have to break that wax and release the honey within, you're gonna have a big mess. So many places in your beehive are separated by a bee space or three eighths of an inch. So your frames are going to be three eighths of an inch approximately from your hive wall. Uh, your top bars, as you'll see in your frame, the top bar versus the end bar and the bottom bar. Um, the top bar is from the inner cover, the bottom bar is from the hive bottom, and two bee spaces to allow uh, bees to easily move between frames. Types of frame foundation. So you can go a couple different routes here. Um, right cell plastic is the most common and it is the easiest to use. For beginning beekeepers, I'd recommend using the right cell plastic. And that's what I've got right here. It's a little bit loose and that's just fine. Once the bees draw it out, it'll be nice and tight. Um, the cool thing about this is you can use it over and over again. Like I said before, I'm about to retire this frame. Uh, this frame is foundationless. It doesn't have a foundation in it. So when I retire this frame, I'm going to have to completely replace it. If this frame had instead had the right self foundation, I would take my hive tool, I would scrape it away, and then I'd be left with the plastic, which could be rebuilt by the bees. So you can use it over and over and over again. Um, the colors don't actually make a difference to the bees. When they're in the hive box, it's nice and dark in there. They're not really paying attention to if it's black or if it's yellow. 
Um, so honey supers, I like to use yellow. Makes the honey look nice, it's easy to see. Um, for the brood box, I think it's actually pretty important to use black foundation. The reason being, when you have brand new wax and black foundation, the brand new wax is white and the foundation is black. You hold it up to the light and you can easily see white eggs on a black foundation. If you're using yellow, it's harder to see the eggs. So when you're doing your hive inspection, you're checking on the health of your queen, you really need to be able to see those eggs. And they're smaller than a grain of rice, so it's it, it can be tough to find them. Real wax, um, you can take a, a, a frame and wire wax into it to help bees draw without using any artificial plastics. The downside to this is it's incredibly fragile and you're probably going to need a couple packs of wax. You're, you're going to wind up breaking some. Extraction can be difficult with real wax as well. Because it's so fragile, the extraction process may break the frame. You'll have to start over again. Um, but the cool thing about re using real wax foundation, particularly with minimal wiring, is you can use it for cut comb honey. You add the real wax frames, let the bees draw it out and cap it, take it out, and all you have to do is cut out of the frame and move your, your comb over and you've got cut comb honey. And there's some appeal to that because uh, cut comb honey can't really be adulterated the same way that liquid honey can be. You've heard um, stories about beekeepers putting sugar syrup into their honey. You can't really tell when it's on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So if you have cut comb honey, it's, it's honey. There's no getting around it really. Foundationless is an option. And that's just literally you have a frame with nothing in it. The, the frame on the top picture right here. It's an option, but it has a lot of drawbacks. The frames are incredibly fragile until they're completely drawn. And if you have an entire box with foundationless frames, there's a pretty good chance that these are going to draw it incorrectly and you're gonna to have to start over from scratch when they draw it perpendicular to frames. So if you're going to go the foundationless route, I highly recommend staggering them with frames that do have foundation. So you can have a couple of frames with and a couple of frames without in those, um, Foundation frames are going to help them draw properly on the foundation frames. And drawn comb. We went over this a little bit earlier, but uh, drawn comb is any frame with a complete uh, cell structure. So, so something that's got a, a deep cell count to it. Foundation like this, it's undrawn. You can't really do much with the depth that you have here. But a drawn frame has deep cells, and then you have room for your queen to lay eggs, you have room for your bees to store food. It, it's essentially a functional frame. These can be saved for years, and they are a beekeeper's most valuable commodity. You can't really just go to the bee store and buy drawn frames. Um, so once you have your frames, it's really important to keep your frames nice. Uh, storage can be an issue particularly when wax moths and other pests, uh, mice are concerned. So um, you can store them in an area that gets good ventilation, good light. Wax moths can't reproduce in well-lit areas. So if you have your boxes staggered, so you have a box here, you have a box perpendicular, 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 that's how you should be stacking your boxes if you've got extra boxes lying around that you need to store. Real wax foundation, I spoke briefly about this, but it is definitely a process of getting these uh, frames wired. We don't sell them pre-wired, unfortunately, so you will have to do a little bit of assembly. You can take a look at our tutorial online. Um, personally, I've never actually wired wax frames before, so I definitely recommend checking out the online tutorial. And then we have a, a list of items that you can use to uh, wire your frames here as well. You don't have to use the form board, but I find it really helps. It keeps the, the wax steady as you're, as you're working in the, the wire. Beekeeping tools and equipment. So I'm going to try to just go over the absolute essentials, things that you can't get into the apiary without. Your hive tool is your number one thing. 
Um, if you're in the apiary and you don't have the hive tool, it's kind of like going to class with no clothes on and no pencil. Um, it's not really something that's functional. You need your hive tool as a pry tool. You need your hive tool as basically, it's just an extension of your arm. You pry open the hive because it's going to be stuck, stuck shut with propolis. It's going to be uh, sticky with honey and all these other things. It's going to help you lift your frames when your fingers are too big to get in there with the heavy leather gloves in there. Your, your hive tool should never, ever leave your hand in the apiary. If you set it down, you might, you might be doing something complicated. Ah, cutting burr comb, another use for the hive tool. As I mentioned before, burr comb is anything that isn't within your frames, comb that's either in your way or in the bee's way. So your hive tool has a sharp end on it and you can easily just slice all of this extra burr comb off. And you're gonna be doing that a lot. Even if you do everything perfectly, you're gonna wind up with burr comb, you're gonna wind up with propolis that you need to scrape away. Um, you want your movable frames to remain movable and you can't really do that without the hive tool. The smoker is your second most important tool. There are very, very few times where I will go into the hive without my smoker lit and ready to go. I might not need it every time, but I have it lit every time because when you need it and you don't have it, you, you basically just ended your apiary visit. Um, the smoke isn't just for the beekeeper, it's also for the bees. The smoke interrupts their sense of smell so they cannot spread alarm pheromones throughout the colony. They will signal each other with pheromones. Hey, there's something wrong. Hey, we need to attack this. So if you interrupt the pheromone transfer, they're not going to be able to tell all their friends, hey, attack the bears here. So that's, that's gonna help keep them calm. It's gonna help keep you calm. And it's going to help save a lot of their lives. Particularly when you are uh, disassembling and reassembling your hive. Whenever you get into a different part of your hive, you're going to wanna use your smoker. Um, just gets a nice layer of smoke going. You don't need too much, but too little is not good either. Um, let the bees know you're there, disassemble. As you're putting your hive equipment back together, usually the, the bees will have uh, raised to the top of the frames, give them some quick, short smoke, and that will make them kind of disperse, go back into the frames. When you add that box back on top, you're not squishing a bunch of bees because they've gone back down into the frames. So it's really important to control your bees to keep them calm, to keep you calm as well. Um, apparel is incredibly important. It's honestly kind of a new thing. Back in Langstroth's day, beekeeping suits weren't really all that common. Most of the time you'd go out there in a hat and a veil. Um, these days I find it's, it's really handy to have a suit, to be comfortable. If you're comfortable, the bees are comfortable. If you're comfortable, you're not gonna make any mistakes and stings are going to be fewer and far between um, because you have that extra layer of protection. It's really up to the beekeeper how much PPE you use. Um, some beekeepers use gloves, some don't. Some beekeepers use just a jacket, others will use a full suit. So whatever you feel most comfortable in. And consider that bee suits are hot. That's the end of the story. You can get vented bee suits, like the one you see in the picture here. You can actually feel the breeze, it's really nice. But when it's 100 degrees out, it's 100 degrees out. And you're gonna be sweating through the suit in about five minutes, no matter what. Social organization. Um, I'm just scratching the surface here. Just gonna give the basics. I could probably talk all day about which bees do what at which stages in their life, but we're gonna just stick with, there are three physiological different bees and they all come from the same bee. The queen bee lays all the eggs, gives birth to every single bee in the colony. She lays somewhere around 2,000 eggs a day or one side of the frame. Um, the queen bee, like I said, lays all the eggs. The drone, his only purpose in life is to basically make sure that the queen can lay. So the drone is the male bee and he fertilizes the queen. He is incapable of feeding himself, um, foraging. Basically, he hangs around in the hive 
and gets waited on by the workers. So it's a pretty sweet life. I mean, you hang out by the pool all day, you go party, and then it's done. The, the downside, though, is uh, there's a bit of a massacre in fall. The, the girls overwinter all by themselves, and they, uh, they will push all of the drones out. They don't want any extra, any extra mouths to feed in winter because winter is pretty tough, and the drones don't contribute much as far as winter survival. Um, so the queen and the drone have their separate roles. The worker does everything. The worker feeds the queen, the worker feeds the drones, the workers gather the water, the workers defend the hive, they clean the hive, they raise the young, um, they gather the pollen, they gather the nectar, they cure the honey, they do everything. So this is most of the hive as well. As far as numbers, you have one queen in a colony, um, drones aren't always around, but during peak drone season, you probably have about 10% drones to workers. And then the rest of the time, you just have one queen and all workers. When you're looking for the queen, it's important to note that they do have a slightly different body construction. So you're not just completely looking for a big B. You're, you're looking for, um, you're seeing these little workers here. Your queen has a bald spot on her, so you're looking for a little shiny spot here. She also has wings that are considerably shorter than her abdomen, and her abdomen is long and pointed as opposed to the round and short uh, abdomen of the drone. The eyes are another thing that separates the drone from the queen. The drones have very large kind of um, almost fly eyes, and they're upward facing. The reason they're upward facing is the drones fly to lower altitude than the queen. So they're looking for the queen, the queen's above them. That's the entire purpose of the drone is to see the queen. So their eyes face above. The queen's eyes are much smaller and more like the workers. So a couple little distinctions that you can look for while you're looking for your queen to uh, assert her health during hive inspections. So let's look at uh, brood. So brood is basically just bee babies. Um, anything from egg to capped brood, this, this is all considered brood. So in the photo on the left, you'll see a bunch of capped brood. These are almost ready to hatch. They're developing the last stage. You also see these uncapped little tiles here, and they've got little wormy larvae in them. Those are considerably younger, but still considered brood. Uh, the angle of this photo isn't quite right, so I can't show you any eggs, unfortunately. But this nice, even pattern. This is all worker larva. Drone brood is a little less organized. Usually drones are a little bit bigger. So you're going to see kind of bulbous um, popped out pieces of, of wax here. And the cappings, instead of being flat with the worker brood are going to be kind of round and bulbous as well. Most beekeepers don't put much stock into having drone in their colony for a couple of reasons. The drone don't contribute to foraging for one. Um, for two, a lot of backyard beekeepers aren't in the business of raising their own queens. So it's not really beneficial to have drone brood around. The biggest reason that a lot of beekeepers will scrape out their drone brood though, is because they are a major vector for burrow mites. Drone brood take longer to hatch and they can sustain an extra life cycle or two of burrow mites. So the burrow mites instinctively seek out drone brood in order to reproduce. The more drone you have, the more potential for higher varroa numbers. So when you see an entire frame just devoted to completely drone, a lot of beekeepers will freeze that frame, scrape that frame back to the foundation, and put it back into the colony, hoping there will be worker brood next. There are actually specifically drawn drone frames for added varroa control. You are concentrating the drone onto a single frame, waiting until it's capped, don't let it hatch or you're going the other way on this one. But waiting until it's capped, removing that, freezing it, getting rid of all of the drone brood with all the varroa mites as well, decreasing your numbers, replacing that back in the colony. Hopefully I didn't go too fast on that one. Okay. So bee breeds. Um, there's not necessarily different species of bees. There are different hybrids of Apis mellifera. So when you're talking Italian Carniolan, standard survivor, we're always talking about Apis mellifera. There are different hybrids of those though. 
Um, they're all imported, um, I think less than a hundred years ago. They're, they're not necessarily native to this continent, honeybees. So when we're talking bee hybrids, we offer Italian and Carniolan here at the store, um, either in package or nuke. The Italian is what all the commercial guys use. They're the most common bee breed. They have very large colony numbers. You're gonna see colonies 60,000 strong on good years. Um, they're gentle, they don't propolize a whole lot. So that makes getting the boxes apart pretty easy. Um, they do draw a lot of burr comb. So we talked about earlier, if you have a frame that's the wrong size, you're gonna draw a bunch of burr comb. That's what I'm talking about here. They're, they're gonna burr any available space. They are moderately hygienic, easy to work, but they have high drift, which means they're likely to enter the wrong colony. So if you have diseases around, you may spread those around. Carniolans are originally from Slovenia, Austria. They're a little bit more um, used to colder climates. And that's part of what makes them my favorite bee. Uh, they'll forage earlier. They'll forage on wetter days than most breeds. You'll have an Italian colony in the hive on a wet kind of moist day. Carniolans are venturing out and seeing what they can find. This isn't always the case, but it's just a kind of generality. They have a pretty fast buildup in spring because they are um, more used to the Northern exposure. They build up quickly. They get whatever resources they can because they know they're gonna have a shorter season. Uh, brood rearing is dependent on available food. So they're less likely to starve. I mentioned that the Italians have very large colonies. That, that's it, they have large colonies. They don't pay attention to how much food is around, the queen just keeps laying. Whereas the Carniolans, the queen seems to kind of know how much food is available. If less food is coming in, she'll reduce her brood rearing, which can be a good or a bad thing, depending on the year and how much you're willing to feed them. Um, they are quite hygienic. They have few brood diseases, um, very little robbing instinct which again is a generality. It doesn't mean they're not, they're not going to rob. It just means they're less likely to rob from other colonies. Um, they're also less likely to build the burr comb, but they're a lot higher probabilizing. So when you get your hive tool out to rip your boxes apart, make sure you do it on a warm day because it's gonna be a big pain. Uh, propolis is kind of interesting because it's really temperature dependent. On a warm day, it's gonna be sticky, but it's going to just pop apart like gum. On a cold day, you basically got mortar in there. So depending on temperature, it's a lot easier to deal with on warmer days. Caucasian and standard survivor. We have had these bees in the past. We're not offering them this year in packages or nukes, but I believe we're going to have them as options for recleaning. Um, so Caucasian is very similar to Carniolan bee. It's uh, from the, the Central Caucasus near the Black Sea. When we were talking about the rhododendron honey, the mad honey, we're talking about Caucasian bees. They're kind of an interesting breed because they're actually different in color from the others. They're black and silver instead of, uh, instead of black and gold. They have the longest tongue out of any of the bee breeds, which means they can forage in a, in a wider area. They, they can access flowers that other bees can't. They are pretty gentle but you've got to be careful about provoking them. They do have some Russian and German lineage in there. So once they're provoked, they're not as likely to calm down. Um, they have a really low swarming instinct, which is nice around here. Uh, once swarming season starts, you really got to keep on top of your colonies. And we're going to get into swarming a little bit more when we get into our next class on um, uh, colony management and hive inspections. They have pretty strong populations, kind of similar to the Carniolan, they will increase brood as resources become more available. They'll kind of decrease um, as forage becomes less available. And they're gonna forage pretty early into the morning and in late into the evening. Again, they're accustomed to shorter seasons. The standard survivor, they're bred for hygiene, low propolizing, high populations. They're kind of like the best of both worlds. Uh, they are variable and companies will tend to look for different traits. Um, when you think of mite biters and things like this, they're, they're looking for mite resistance. Um, but standard survivors do change. 
And I like to kind of think of them as um, when you go, when you go to Humane Society and go, oh well, what's that dog? Well, he's a mutt. Mutts always make the best dogs. Now, as far as procuring these, there are a couple different ways you can go about it. Uh, your typical ways are packages, snooks, or uh, caught swarms. Packages are going to arrive the earliest. If you want to get a start on bees right away, package bees are the way to go. Um, they are essentially an artificial swarm. Uh, commercial beekeepers will take frames from many of their colonies. They'll dump them into a large container and funnel them into packages. So you're getting bees from a lot of different colonies. Um, they uh, are less expensive than nukes. And they're great if you have drawn frames already. If you have undrawn frames, it's gonna set them back a little bit. You're gonna need to feed them, but you're gonna get the added benefit of having that beautiful white and wax. I actually started my first colony with a package. And if you've never done it, I definitely recommend it. You can bees from different uh hives, mm -hmm. putting them in a box with a different queen. Correct. So they all get along? That's why the queen's in the cage when you get her. Okay. So all of the bees, they don't have anything to protect. They don't have a queen around. They're like, hey, something's weird here. We're moving to a new home. You have a queen in a cage, so they can't attack her. And her pheromones are spreading throughout this artificial swarm as she's in transport. So about three days after um, they arrive, the queen is going to be released because she has gotten pheromones throughout the rest of the colony. But sometimes they don't accept queens when you're the queen. That's right? correct. So it's kind of a gamble. It can be. Um, it's very rare that they don't accept the queen in a package. And usually about a week after packages arrive here, you can still bring back an empty uh, a queen in a cage that has died and will replace her for free. Okay. Because it does happen occasionally, but it's pretty rare. Uh, the benefits of package bees is they're pretty easy to medicate. They don't have any brood, so many medications will work. Most of your mite medications don't get through capped brood. So wax cappings are something that would stop medication. Um, it makes it pretty easy to, to medicate bees. Uh, nucleus hives. Different companies will have different setups for nukes. Your typical configuration is you have a corrugated nuke box, you have five frames within, and you have all of those frames that are drawn. So this is essentially a miniature hive that's portable. Um, when you take this home, installation is as simple as remove five frames from your current hive setup and put the frames that are in your nuke straight into your hive and you're done. So it's really, really simple. If you're a little bit weary about installing a package, this is an easier way to go. They do take a little bit longer to get here. They're usually a full month after the packages arrive. Um, but you're starting with a queen that's already out in your nuke. So she is actively laying eggs. You have um, brood, you have nectar, you have pollen, you have a, a small colony going on. So if you have to leave for a little while, they're gonna be okay. They still need to be fed. They still need to be built up but this is kind of a, a really good foundation to start with. Also the nuke box is kind of cool. I use nuke boxes for all sorts of things, anything from a beekeeper's toolbox to hold my hive tool, my frame, extra frames, my smoker, things like that. Um, you can use them for holding extra frames as long as you leave the lid off so light can uh, penetrate through. You can use them as swarm catchers as well. They're really handy as swarm catchers. No, my bar was in the way. Swarms. So swarms can be a good thing. They couldn't be a bad thing, depending on time of year. It's not guaranteed that you're going to get a swarm. But if you're a little tight on cash and you want to give it a try, swarms are absolutely free. All you have to do is be in the right place at the right time and have the right equipment. Um, so early on, swarms are really valuable. They can make amazing colonies. Later in the season, it's going to be harder to keep them healthy and to get them through the winter. 
So there's an old saying that I read in a bee book somewhere, and it was so long ago, I don't remember where it came from. But a swarm in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. But a swarm in July ain't worth a fly. July is when you're usually taking honey from a colony. If you're installing a colony in July, it's gonna be very difficult for them to build up enough brood, build up enough population, build up enough food stores to get them through winter. So the earlier you can get a swarm, the better. And that also goes for if your colony swarms late in the season. When a swarm occurs, um, your colony is left with about 40% of the bees, whereas 60% and your actively laying queen leave. So late in the season, if you get that kind of a population decrease, it's gonna be really hard for them to recover. Um, as far as finding swarms and getting good sources for them, your local beekeeping clubs are really an invaluable source. Uh, Lynn Metton Beekeepers Association has a phone tree and you can choose which area you're most comfortable getting swarms from. So if you wanna get swarms only in Philomath or Albany or a certain part of Corvallis, you can sign up for that, they'll give you a call. Um, you do have to do it right here, right now. You pick up the phone, there's a swarm, try to be out within an hour or two because they don't stay in the same spot for very long. Um, catching a swarm can be very simple or it can be very complicated depending on where the swarm is and how high off the ground it is. You'll absolutely need a container for your bees, a way to secure your container for travel. You can use duct tape, you can use an old belt, uh, all sorts of different ways of doing it. But you wanna make sure you have a bee tight container with you. Um, you wanna use good PPE. Swarms are generally very docile and you do see uh, Texas beekeepers running in with no gloves, no hat, nothing, just reaching in. Please wear some PPE. <laughs> you don't have to, but I strongly recommend it. Um, a bee brush can be really helpful. Uh, location specific items. If you have a swarm, say up in a tree, make sure you bring a ladder. Um, if you've got a swarm that's on a really small branch, they can easily be moved all at the same time. Bring some lockers, take the whole branch. Uh, patience is key here though. Once you get the queen, you've got the rest of the colony and they will all follow. You just have to have patience. Usually the queen is going to be in the center of the swarm. So if you get the bulk of the swarm into your swarm container, just stand back and wait. Usually you'll see them flowing in after about five minutes or so. If you know where the queen is and you're concerned about keeping her where you want her, you can use um, a swarm clip. It basically looks like a little hair clip and it has a screen on it so she can be fed through it and the bees can access her, but she can't escape. So you can set the, the queen catcher in your swarm container and know that she's safe and uh, away from any potential crushings. Interesting thing about swarming bees is when they swarm, they don't know exactly when they're gonna find their next home. So all of the workers gorge as much honey as they can. They take as much pollen as they, they take everything that they can resource wise before they fly away. So their honey stomach is completely full, which presses on their stinger and makes them basically incapable of stinging. Um, not everybody's gonna be gorged because there are some scout bees that are gonna be flying around looking for new locations, but most bees can't actually swarm you when, or can't actually sting you when they're in a swarm. Um, just briefly going over inspections and feeding, we do have another class that's going to um, contain a lot more information on this, but your hives are probably going to arrive around the time that class occurs. Uh, just wanted to go over it briefly. Once you have your hives all set up, your bees safely inside, and they've kind of adjusted a little bit, um, regular hive inspections can begin. You are going to want to inspect your hive about once every two weeks. This prevents swarming for one, because it takes a little over two weeks for a queen bee to develop from an egg to hatching. So you're catching any, um, any new queens and preventing swarms. You are making sure they're continuing to be fed. You're making sure they're disease free. Once every two weeks seems to be just the magic number here. Um, in springtime, you're going to want to feed a one-to-one -one solution of sugar to water. So just 50-50. You don't have to use any special measurements or anything, but I find that um, a, a mixer is definitely handy. Depending on how many hives you have, 
I've actually got a five gallon bucket and a, a paddle on my drill. So I just stick my drill on the bucket and it's really easy to mix, but you might use a, a kitchen mixer or any number of things. The important thing here is to make sure you do not boil water. When you boil sugar in water, there's a chemical reaction which actually can really harm your bees. So cold water is fine, warm water is fine, just as long as it doesn't boil. And so what you're doing when you're feeding this 50-50 solution is you're simulating a light nectar flow. In the springtime, the flowers are just popping out. They're having a little bit of nectar, but it's not really a heavy flow. So you are letting the bees know that it's springtime. We should start building our production. We should start building our wax, but they're not really storing it. They're just consuming it. In the fall, we're going for a different angle here. We're feeding a much heavier sugar solution in fall, a two part sugar to one part water solution. This is simulating a really heavy nectar flow. This is telling the bees, hey, winter is coming. We got to store this stuff. It's a lot easier for the bees to dehydrate and store in cells. So this is going to add to the weight of your hive. This is going to add to your winter stores. Protein feed is basically an all year thing. Um, depending on how the season is, how active your bees are uh, in bringing, or bringing uh, protein back, you may need to use more or less protein. Uh, the protein patties you see in the upper photo here are just pollen substitutes. So you should have lots of pollen stores in here, but the bees are going to uh, benefit from having an extra protein patty in here. If they aren't eating it after your two week hive inspections, reduce the amount you feed but always make sure there's a little bit in there that they have access to. If the queen doesn't have enough protein, she doesn't lay, and that can cause all sorts of problems. And we'll get into um, different types of protein in our winterizing class, but there are spring protein patties and winter protein patties with different amounts uh, and percentages of protein as well. Um, and like I said briefly before, bees do prefer natural pollen. So if there's an excess of pollen out in nature, they're not going to be consuming the protein patty as quickly, but it's good to have a little bit in there just to gauge how much they are actually consuming. Um, integrated pest management, we're getting towards the end now. Sorry, I've gone quite a bit over guys. <laughs> um, when you receive your packages, no brood is present, which means you can treat with a couple different things. Um, there are many different mycocytes out there, which I won't be covering today, but I tend to use naturally derived um, bee medications. So these are things that come straight from plants or straight from different animals. Apigard uses thymol, which comes from the thyme plant. Um, so when you install your package, you don't wanna treat right away. You want them to realize they have a new home, be comfortable in that new home. You don't want them to be shocked after a shock. So wait five to seven days for the bees to become settled. Make sure they've got some food, they're drawing wax. Um, because you have a package of bees instead of like a full size colony, your instructions for treatment are gonna be slightly different than what the instructions on the package are going to say. So one tray of Avogard will do it for a package of bees. Um, I actually have a YouTube video. I've got the link below here. You can watch as I treat one colony for, uh, for varroa mites with apigard as well. So you can get kind of a visual on this. It's a lot easier just to watch it than to have me um, spout out a bunch of jargon. <laughs> so treatment is typically complete after seven to 14 days if you read the label. Um, the tray should be empty. There might be a couple little crystallized bits in there, but the, the gel should be basically gone when your treatment is complete. Um, do, the bees, do the bees eat it or is it just? Excellent question. The bees don't eat the apigard, but they find it as a foreign material and they want to get rid of it. They want to get it out of the hive. So they'll collect it. And when they go from the top of the hive where your apigard tray is, down to the bottom of the hive and out to get rid of it, they spread it throughout the rest of the hive. It doesn't work if the bees aren't actually in there collecting it. So if it's still in the tray, it's not doing anything. It's not a fumigant. So mm -hmm. they have to actually be in direct contact with the medication.
All right. And once treatment is over, you can safely continue feeding with your liquid feed and your protein feed. And then we'll definitely go over more of this in the next class. Um, so talking about a different type of medication here for a different scenario. Um, formic acid is uh, the typical thing that makes ants smell bad, basically. So it's found in lots of different living things in different concentrations. It's actually found in honeybees as well. But highly concentrated formic acid will kill varroa mites. Formic Pro is very strong. So you have to be kind of careful not to overdose your bees because it can cause brood death, it can cause queen loss, and it can cause lots of problems in the hive if you overdo it, if you do it at the wrong temperature. So it's really important that you read the label on this one um, and you consider how full your colony is. I recommend using Formic Pro uh, for treating nuke colonies, but you have to make sure that they're drawing before you start using it. So where am I here? This is the one medication that I know of that's naturally derived that will actually get through your wax cappings. So if you have a new colony that has five or more frames, it's really important that they're populous enough to be able to use this medication. You can use one strip and it will treat everything. You don't have to do an additional strip because it gets through the wax cappings. It treats everything all at once. Whereas most medications you have to treat, wait, and then treat so that you get the brood that was under the capping for the first treatment. Okay, when and how to treat a nuke. Um, install and feed your nuke with sugar and protein. Make sure they're, they're established, they're beginning to draw. Formic Pro must have at least five frames of bees in order to not hurt the bees when you treat. So two to three weeks is usually when you're going to start using this after installation. Um, you're gonna lay one strip of the formic acid on top of your frames perpendicular. So just like you would feed a piece of protein, this is the exact same method. Once the strip is dried out into a cake, you can easily remove it and then continue your normal feeding and inspections. But it's uh, similar to Apigard and it usually takes about seven to 14 days to complete. And unlike uh, Tymol, this actually is a fumigant. So the bees don't need to touch it or come into contact with it. It just needs to sit there and fumigate throughout the hive. Um, I think on the package, actually, it'll tell you to make sure that it's ventilated enough, though. Because it's so strong, you want to remove your entrance reducer and make sure there's good airflow while you're using it. And there's also a video um, on YouTube of me treating a hive with formic acid. So if that was confusing at all, sometimes the visual is a little bit easier. Um, so online resources, we have a couple things here. There are several written tutorials with photos on our website. You can also find lots of different videos on our YouTube page, including this class in the next couple of days. Um, if you go down to playlists, you can find beekeeping playlist and you can find a uh, new folder 2023 uh, Zoom classes, and it'll be in both of those folders. Um, tools for Varroa management. This is actually a really interesting website. If you have any questions about whether or not you should treat your hive for varroa mites, go through this little survey and it'll tell you, all right, this is when you should treat, this is what your mite load is looking like, a couple of interesting things on there. Um, I'm kind of old school, I like to kind of just go with the, the paper. So uh, here's are a couple of my favorite books. The Beekeeper's Handbook is by far the best bang for your buck. It has lots of really interesting diagrams. It has easy to read information, um, no full color pictures, but it's comprehensive, it's easy to read. There's some good humor in it too, actually. Um, the Backyard Beekeeper by Kim Flotum is a really interesting read, full color photos, lots of interesting information. Cool thing about the Backyard Beekeeper is it has multiple hive configurations with multiple different types of hives. So if you don't want to do a Langstroth hive, maybe you want something that's lighter weight, easier to manage. Um, it has top bar hive beekeeping and a couple of other different things too. So uh, a little more expansive. If you're really getting technical, 
and you want to deal with honeybee biology, you want to deal with specialists who have worked their entire lives for a single chapter in a book, then honeybee biology and beekeeping and the hive of the honeybee are some really in-depth books that are easy to read. They have really reputable sources. Uh, you've probably heard the name Dewey Caron and uh, the hive of the honeybee is uh, directly from L.L. Langstroth and then beekeepers who have uh, upheld his work over the years. Garden Plants for Honeybees, uh, this book down here in the corner, is my favorite book for planting and looking at different nectar and pollen resources. The cool thing about it is it is um, organized by month. So you can open to, it's January right now, open to January. And it has full color photos of all these different plants in the area. And it has a five-star rating of uh, pollen resource and nectar resource of each plant. So you've got bloom time, you've got full color photos, and then you've got resource availability, whether or not this plant's actually useful for your colony. So a couple of my favorite things there. And you only have to read a chapter a month. <laughs> all right, thanks everyone for your patience with my first hybrid class. Really appreciate you all being here. And uh, now I'd like to open it up for first off questions online and then we'll move on to questions in class. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Usually get one or two questions here. Also definitely welcome to use the chat box. Um, I'll come back to the online classmates. Do we have any questions here? Um, time of day to work the hive. Is there a better time when they're out foraging? That's a good question. So best time of day to work the hives. Um, really, it depends on the beekeeper schedule. Ultimately, you can work the bees any time of day as long as the temperature and the weather conditions are right. So um, it's easiest to work them when they're out foraging. There's less bees in the colony. It's easier for you to move the frames around. The temperature should be at least 55 degrees or above. Um, for the beekeeper's safety, it should probably be 90 degrees or below because it gets so hot in the bee suit. Um, time doesn't always allow for a perfect time of day. So whenever you can, you kind of have to. Um, but I usually do my beekeeping late in the afternoon after work. I've got another question in chat. How can we view later? So that's a good question. I've got my resources online here. If you go to YouTube, you can type in Chenards, click on the little dragonfly. And then if you go to playlists right here, we're gonna have a beekeeping playlist and you can find that video here. The video will probably be uploaded within the next couple of days. Any other questions? All right, well, I'm gonna close it down for the day then. Uh, thanks everyone for joining me and for uh, sparing me the extra hour. <laughs> have a good morning. <laughs>